Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. Today we have really an amazing guest, a Harvard graduate, an internist, a New York physician who's right in the epicenter of COVID-19, a colleague and a friend. We have Dr. Leo Galland. The topic is COVID-19, and crisis always has so, so many sides. Some of those sides are hopeful, and I just want to say what the um, UN Secretary General Antonio Guertes urged everybody warning parties across the world to lay down their arms because we all need to fight in the same fight. He said, the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war. That is why today I'm calling for an immediate global ceasefire in all corners of the world. It's time to put armed conflict on lockdown and focus together on the true fight for our lives. So we have Dr. Leo Galland. I'm going to tell you a little bit about his background, but then we're going to go in to ask him lots of questions about COVID, about this fight for our lives. Dr. Galland is um, an honors graduate of Harvard University. He received his medical training at New York University. He taught at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Stony Brook University, one of my very favorite places, uh, institutions of learning. He's a board-certified internist, and I know he's done a lot of work in immunology. He's authored more than 40 scientific articles, and he has written several chapters for numerous textbooks, including integrative gastroenterology. In fact, he has such a focus, he's one of the real world's experts on leaky gut and the role of the gut in other diseases. And years ago, Dr. Gallant and I designed, formulated a number of digestive products for allergy research together. He has many books out, which are quite extraordinary. I remember he came to Santa Fe, New Mexico, when his book, The Four Pillars of Healing, launched, and I sat in a bookstore listening to him chat about that, and he said, I love writing, but it almost kills you. I don't know if I'm going to write any more books, and I can really understand the feeling of that. He's also written Super Immunity for Kids, Power Healing, The Fat Resistance Diet, and with his son, Jonathan, the allergy solution. I remember Dr. Galland. I said to you when we were just getting ready to do the show, we lectured somewhere together in Seattle and we were going to lecture. We already lectured. It was winter out and your wife and I and you were in a pool in a hotel. It's a scene that sticks in my brain. <laughs> this was decades ago, right? Oh yeah, it was decades ago. I remember sitting in the audience and thinking, what, what a smart plus heart physician you are, and you're still doing the work. So you're right there in the epicenter of New York. Can you talk to us about what's going on and what you're thinking about COVID-19? Right. Well, I mean, what's going on here right now is that the streets are empty. Um, I look out uh, Fifth Avenue. There's hardly anybody there. There's no traffic. It's very eerie, like a ghost town. If you walk over to the hospitals, they're packed. They're spilling out into the streets. There's tents, uh, field hospitals set up in Central Park. Um, there are trucks outside the chief medical examiner's office, also known as the city morgue. I mean, it's um, two cities, one deserted and the other being held together by the um, really the grit and commitment of healthcare workers who put their lives on the line all day. And I'm not just talking about nurses and doctors. It's everybody. It's the, um, the people who, um, who are doing cleaning up. It's the porters who are moving patients. Uh, it's the people who are um, taking all the contaminated garbage and putting it out. And they don't get paid very much. I mean, there is, um, there is a tremendous level of commitment. And, um, yeah, and the people here really take this seriously because we know what's happening. We can see it. We can see it all around us. We can look at the numbers. And those same, same numbers are eventually going to sweep across the country. And I really hope that the same spirit of commitment that I see in New York is going to be national, that we're going to see that. 
There's been some talk recently that quite a number of countries haven't been transparent about their numbers, how many people were affected, how many fatalities, how many urns were lining the street. So I guess what we're seeing in New York might really be what's going on or has gone on in other places, but we haven't been told about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I have a patient who's in Paris now, and it's frightening there. It's um, The situation may be worse than in New York, but we're not hearing about that. Right. Um, the, um, I mean, we can get into all of the um, horror of the situation, and I will say that that the numbers that predict a worst-case scenario have been correct. Um, the calculations that I woke up doing in the middle of the night a few weeks ago figuring where is this going. Uh, they're actually now the CDC and the White House are citing those numbers. To me, the math just made sense and it was scary and it was hard to believe. Um, at a time when there were only 89 reported cases in the U.S. and two deaths, um, you had to understand exponential math and you had to be able to look four-dimensionally at what's happening to realize where would we would be today and where we're going to be a month from now. Um, so it is a very um, frightening, challenging situation, but it also is a situation in which we can meet challenges. And, um, and I don't think it's a time for discouragement. I think it's a time for pulling together with focus and purpose. Now, uh, um, about two months ago, when I realized that this is going outside China. It was late January. Um, and patients of mine are going to have a lot of questions and concerns. I decided I, I better really understand this virus and what's going on. I never planned on being somebody who would make, be making public statements about the COVID-19 epidemic, which I have wound up doing the past week. Um, and so I just, um, furiously began to research coronaviruses in general, whatever was known about COVID-19 at the time, looking back to SARS and MERS, the two previous um, de um, really deadly epidemics, um, immersing myself in the biology and the immune response. And I started to see certain patterns. I mean, this is something that I've done in different areas during the course of my career. I don't think ever, never under the kind of circumstances that we're experiencing now. Um, and so I started putting together guidelines, protective guidelines for my patients. Um, and, I, and I probably got the first version together about a month ago. It's undergone about seven or eight revisions since then, because on a daily basis, I'm looking at the news that's coming out about the virus, uh, the scientific news, um, and thinking about what this means and what people can do. And so, um, and I, I'll send you, actually, the latest formulation is always up on my website, drgallon.com. Um, I'll send you something that maybe is a little more complete uh, advice that I'm giving patients what we can do. Uh, there are two things that I think are really important to realize. The first, and I think this is important for people who are outside the metropolitan areas that are already stricken, this is going to sweep through the entire country. There, in terms of the math, it's very likely that there are millions of people infected at present who don't know it. And the 200,000 proven cases is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and it's from that that you get to the prediction of the um, White House at this point, that as many as a quarter million people will die over the next few weeks, even if everything is done right. Uh, and given that the case fatality rate for this virus is about 1%, 250,000 people die, they come from a pool of 25 million people who are infected. Um, it's just simple math. And, um, um, you know, we can go back over, over the the scary statistics, not really, but I've, that's not really what I want to do. The other thing is that um, 
all the quarantines that are in effect and that I really think should be standardized and national because if if certain areas quarantine like New York is doing it, we're going to see a peak of hospitalizations and deaths in three to four weeks, and the numbers are going to start to go down. But the, the map will change because those places, this is highly contagious. It's at least twice as contagious as the flu and at least 10 times more deadly. So the map of the disaster map will move, and the places that haven't been quarantining is where you'll start seeing the cases um, going up. And the fact that New York has the, by far the greatest population density in the country is the reason that we're the epicenter now. But this is not a virus that cares about geography or population density. It just cares about people being in contact with one another. Um, so that's one point. The second point is that all of these quarantine measures are not designed to end the epidemic and will not do it. They're designed to slow the flow of new cases so that the healthcare system is not totally crushed by the people requiring hospitalization. So that means success in this setting is not only limiting deaths to a couple of hundred thousand, it is stretching this out for maybe nine months, um, which uh, until something better, some way to deal with this better is found. Maybe that something better will be vaccines. Maybe it will be treatments. What I've worked on for um, my patients is our strategies that can help to protect them. Because with this second wave that's inevitably going to happen, the more people who are able, who have, who are able to resist the um, devastating effects of the infection, the better. See, I mean, here's what's really crazy and quirky about it. At least 80% of people who get infected with this virus have almost no symptoms or just a trivial illness, recover in a few days, and that's the end of it for them. Um, however, they remain infectious for at least a couple of weeks. Um, the minimum time is probably eight days um, following recovery from symptoms. And um, the longest time reported, I think, from the onset of infection to the end of infectivity is about 37 days. Um, and even when people are have negative swabs in their nose and, and throat, uh, the, a study in China found that 23% of people still tested positive in stool. Right. So you're still shedding this in your bowel movements, and we don't know how, that, how long that goes on and what that means for the spread of the infection through food or water or contamination or, or you know, or something like that. Um, so I think an important goal looking ahead is how do we expand that 80%? to make it 90% or 95%. How do you keep yourself personally in the 80% or 90% that only has this mild infection, what I call phase one, and doesn't go on to phase two, which starts after about a week, in which there's pneumonia that can become really serious, can progress um, to needing critical care, a circulatory collapse, heart failure, and death. And being able to keep people out of that, to expand that percentage and keep yourself in it of the people who only have a mild illness, that's good for you. It is good for everyone in your community. It is good for the country. So that, I think, is a really important goal. And you don't really see very much about it out there. Um, so here are the conclusions that I came up with, uh, and they require some science. I mean, this is not just, oh, make your immune system stronger. In fact, that advice may even be wrong or counterproductive. Uh, it's not about that. It's about understanding the biology of this particular virus and why it devastates some people, but not most people. And it starts with a protein. Uh, in your on your cells that is called ACE2. And ACE2 
and the resilience of ACE2 in your body, I really think is the key to the outcome of this. Um, so ACE2 is, an, is actually an enzyme. It is found on the surfaces of many cells, uh, and it, um, it, uh, it, um, it is a transmembrane protein. That is, it goes across the whole membrane of the cell. And it is a vitally important enzyme for health. ACE2 is not something that you want to get rid of or block. Uh, and when, the, when COVID-19, and the same thing was true with SARS, binds to ACE2 to get into the cell, it damages the enzyme. In the words of one researcher, it produces ACE2 exhaustion. Now, without ACE2 functioning properly, blood flow is negatively impacted, heart function is negatively impacted, inflammation leaps up. Um, ACE2 in the lungs has the same distribution as the locations where COVID-19 pneumonia occurs. You do a CAT scan, chest X-ray isn't good enough, on someone who has the flu and had pneumonia, they have one kind of pattern. Mostly it's bacterial pneumonia after recovery from the flu. You do a CAT scan on someone who has COVID-19 pneumonia, it has a very characteristic pattern, kind of what they call a ground glass appearance in the periphery, the outer parts of the lung. That is where the ACE2 is located. And that is a sign that the virus is damaging ACE2 and creating inflammation in those parts of the lung. And there are a whole host of studies in animals in particular looking at different kinds of lung injury, not SARS and other kinds of viral infections, but even toxic injury that has nothing to do with infection that shows that if you administer ACE2 intravenously to those animals, you reverse the lung damage. This is a very important vital enzyme. It's important in the kidneys and in the GI tract as well. So my strategy is how do we make ACE2 resilient? How do we protect it so that when the virus enters the cell and through ACE2 and it damages it, it, um, it's able to bounce back. I think some of the features of this disease can be explained by ACE2 exhaustion. Uh, for example, the period, these two phases, phase one where you just have a mild illness, and then for 20%, uh, uh, about a week later, instead of it going away, it gets worse, leading eventually to a, sometimes a very sudden collapse. That That kind of trajectory can be explained by the exhaustion of ACE2 in those people, maybe in different stages. The, um, the other thing is the fact that this disease, has, that the mortality rate increases with age, reflects the decreasing ACE2 levels that people normally have with age. And the fact that the groups that are most susceptible to getting sick with this virus are people with high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease. Um, those are all conditions in which ACE2 is impaired to begin with. And what's interesting is that people who have immune deficiencies are not necessarily more uh, um, susceptible to damage from this virus. And there was a, um, there was a uh, report, there was a study reported from Italy where they looked mostly at kids who had gotten ki um, tra organ transplants or had had cancer and were on chemotherapy. They don't have a higher rate of illness or death from ACE2 than totally healthy kids. So this is not something that is basically looking for the immune impaired. This is something that's looking for people who have an ACE2 deficit. Can you talk about the controversy of the ACE2 inhibitors, people that are on? Yeah, that, okay. is, that is so poorly thought out. Um, it should just disappear. Good. Um, I'm so glad. Yeah, <laughs> I right. That. The, um, but... But there are people, professors no less, who have written about this with no evidence at all. The only evidence is the opposite of what they're proposing. And so what they propose is, is this, that there are a couple of drugs that are used for treating high blood pressure, drug classes 
called ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, ARB, which when people take them, they have a higher level of ACE2 protein in their blood, on their cells. By the way, curcumin also increases the amount of ACE2 in cells. And because the um, death rate and Meaning the rate turmeric of turmeric for everyone out there. What? Curcuminoid is a flavonoid of turmeric, yeah. just to clarify. Right, okay. yeah. Um, so um, because maybe 30% of people who get seriously ill have high blood pressure to begin with, some of these um, professors said, well, a lot of them are going to be on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin blockers, uh, receptor blockers, and so they must have an elevated ACE2, which means they have more receptors for the virus in their cells, and that has to be a bad thing. That's why they're getting so sick. No evidence to support that. When the Chinese looked at it, because the data that they cited did not include um, a description of what antihypertensive medications people right, were Right, which medications when, they were on. Right. And isn't the there Chinese a study right that, now by the NIH looking at Losartan to treat this? Yeah, absolutely, for good right. reason. Right. Um, although I think you have to be on it beforehand. I don't know. I went on it. I don't have high blood pressure, but when all this hit, I started to take a small amount as a prophylactic measure. Uh, That may be, that really may be reasonable. So when the Chinese looked at the association between different kinds of blood pressure medication and the severity of COVID-19, they found no association between the use of ACE2 inhibitors or ARBs and severity which not only debunks that therapy, that, that, that theory, it also maybe indicates that the Losartan isn't going to help. But um, the more interesting study from China measured um, a, a, an enzyme in the blood called angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 is a substance produced by ACE, ACE1, not by ACE2. See, there are two forms of this enzyme, ACE. Angiotensin 2 is a bad guy in hypertension and in kidney disease and in diabetes. It constricts blood vessels. It's pro-inflammatory. Higher levels of angiotensin 2 are associated with high blood pressure, diabetes, and a number, and adverse cardiovascular outcomes. It turns out that high levels of angiotensin 2 are associated with a higher viral load and a worse outcome with COVID-19. Now, the main thing that is getting rid of angiotensin II in your blood is ACE2. That's its function. It breaks down angiotensin II and converts it to a beneficial peptide called angiotensin 1-7 or ANG-1-7. So that study in itself indicates that People who are more sick have less ACE2 activity. Not can you say that all ACE2 one more activity. time, just a little bit more? Just go through that. I, I, and yes, because, I will. Because some compounding pharmacists are now uh, making that peptide available, actually. So we'll go to well, that I after. I don't know you... if it's available yet. I would love to see it available. I, I just talked on, to Jim Hinsir from um, Las Colinas Pharmacy the day before yesterday, right. and I asked him if he could get that peptide. So I'm going to connect the two of you together. But if you okay, could just right. build that picture to... one more time and then take us yeah. to that peptide. Yeah, let, okay. me, let, me, so let me go into that. Okay. So um, the way this system called the renin-angiotensin system works is that there is an enzyme called ACE. I'm going to call it ACE1 to distinguish it from ACE2, which has been known about for decades. ACE2 was only discovered a couple of decades ago. And ACE1 takes um, a precursor of angiotensin 2 and converts it to angiotensin 2. And its name is, A stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin 2 is a very dangerous chemical in the body. I mean, we need it, but it's also, it's also dangerous because it constricts blood vessels, it raises blood pressure, it maybe has a prothrombotic effect, so it increases the risk of blood clots, it impairs kidney function, um, it is elevated in people with diabetes, uh, in people with high blood pressure, in people with heart failure and coronary artery disease. 
Um, is it elevated in this phase two, the cytokine storm of yes, COVID-19? It is, it is okay. maybe the reason there is a cytokine storm uh-huh. in people who, who are dying. What the Chinese researchers showed was that the viral load and the severity of their illness was directly related to the level of angiotensin II in blood, uh-huh. which is a re- which doesn't prove that you should try to reduce angiotensin II, but it builds a pretty good case for why ACE2 is critically important, because the function of ACE2 is to break down angiotensin II and lower the level. And so what this tells us is people who are sicker have less ACE2 because they have more angiotensin too. So you're saying, so if you have a healthier level of ACE2, what it does is it keeps your body at the just right Goldilocks level of the ACE2 damaging. Right. Well, right. But it's right. It keeps the angiotensin II level down. I just want to focus on this, the meaning of this study. The more ACE2 you have, the lower your angiotensin II is going to be. Um, it's a balance, actually, between ACE1 and ACE2. You want the right balance in your body. And if the angiotensin 2 is going up, it means you got too much ACE1 and not enough ACE2. And this virus is damaging ACE2. That, to me, is proof of what a lot of scientists have said and when they've looked at this in animals, that it's the ACE2 exhaustion that is responsible for the severity of the disease. It's not the ACE2. The ACE2 is not the problem. It's the solution. And in fact, if you administer ACE2 intra- intravenously, you help the, the disease. And you help it by two mechanisms. One is you can, because the virus attaches to it, the soluble free ACE2 that's circulating in your blood gets rid of virus. But more importantly, it helps repair the damage in the lungs. Now. Is what anybody ACE2? doing this? Do they have this intervention? Uh, actually, available? there have been studies on recombinant ACE2 that have been done. And um, I think it's um, GlaxoSmithKline that has a patent on it. I wrote to one of their scientists and said, hey, how about getting this out there? He hasn't written back to me. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I think that that is – there are many approaches being ta- taken to try and improve treatment. And if better treatments happen, that – 250,000 number can come down if those treatments are available and used over the next few weeks. We don't have a lot of time. We do not have a lot of time to go looking and testing treatments. Now, the product of ACE2 is a peptide called angiotensin 1-7. And angiotensin 1-7 has protective and beneficial effects. Possibly the benefits of angiotensin, probably the benefits of ACE2 are result to the, are the result of the production of ACE1. Uh, I'm sorry. Angio. <laughs> it's a A-N- lot of words here. <laughs> and the production of angiotensin 1-7 is responsible for many of the benefits of ACE2. And so it is exciting that there are farm compounding pharmacies working on getting approval to make angiotensin 1-7. Uh, it actually works when taken orally. There is one study in a different setting showing that, um, which would make it way easier. So to it administer. bypasses the stomach acid and everything like that. It gets through the stomach. It's absorbed. There are it can work systemically when taken orally. It doesn't have to be injected, which. Um, may make this a really good treatment when somebody gets sick to prevent the worsening of lung disease, to compensate for what's going on. So I I, I think that's an exciting possibility. Um, uh, There are many exciting possibilities that target ACE2 and the the effect of of the virus on ACE2 and also the likelihood that um, the virus will attach to it because there are drug companies now that are looking into um, finding ways to block the attachment of COVID-19 to ACE2. Because it's got these little S proteins like prawns, right? Right, right. Well, in order to have, right. So the structure of it is 
it looks like um, a sunburst, uh, right? Yeah, it looks it looks like yeah something like that. It's got spikes sticking out of it, and the protein at the end of the spike fits in directly into something in into the ACE2 molecule. But in order to do that, it doesn't normally. In and and this actually. Um, is reflected in some fascinating genetic research that has just been done. The protein, the S protein, has to be altered before it will fit into the ACE2 receptor, into that loop in the ACE2. And there are a number of candidate enzymes called proteases for what alters that, that protein. There's this fascinating study that just um, was just published that looked at the DNA of the vi- of this virus, compared it to the DNA of other coronaviruses in animals and humans, and reached certain conclusions about the evolution of the virus. And um, basically, it zeroed in on a, an enzyme called furin, F-U-R-I-N. And what seems to have happened and what allowed this virus that may have been around even in humans for a long time, what allowed this virus to suddenly be able to take off and create an epidemic was that there was a series of mutations that gave it a much higher affinity for furin. So that now it, it, it like locks onto furin kind of like a magnet, and then the furin changes it and makes it fit much better into the ACE2 molecule. So it's I a thought, so process. maybe I got this wrong. I thought that it could go into the ACE2 molecule, and that was cells that had ACE2 on them, but there also were furin enzymes on almost all our cells' membrane, and that, that way it could get in us outside of the ACE2 well, receptor. No, no, the, nope. the furin okay. enables it. The furin is on all of the cells. ACE2 is not. But the furin, which is also on the cell surface, allows it to lock into, I see. To, to, to really lock very tightly into ACE2. And in fact, the, the locking of COVID-19 into ACE2 is much tighter and stronger than it was for SARS. And is it also true that with SARS and most of the other viruses, they they just make copies, they make copies, they make copies, and then they're prone to making mistakes in those copies, and they can get milder and peter out, but that this virus has the ability to self-correct its copies, and Uh, and so it makes less mistakes to be Uh, less prone. That may be. I'm not sure about that. I think we're going to need more data on it. Um, One thing that I would say about the the virulence of infectious organisms, especially viruses that replicate quickly in general, is that human behavior shapes the virulence of the virus itself. In other words, it's not just impacting us, it's actually selecting mutations that the virus has. Because viruses that produce, that reproduce rapidly make a lot of mutations, clearly. And, um, the, if you make it easy for a virus to spread from person to person, the virus will become more virulent because the more virulent strains and mutations take over and they, sque- and they outpace the more benign strains of the virus. However, if, if you make it harder for the virus to spread from person to person through social distancing, for example, those really virulent strains, they don't have much of an opportunity. They're going to kill you (laughs) before you spread it to somebody else. So that allows the less virulent strains to dominate so that if you're not so sick, you have more of an opportunity to spread the virus from person to person. So our behavior not only impacts us, it actually impacts the characteristics of the virus itself. 
So you're saying something that nobody else is saying that we should be screaming from the rooftops if, as long as we're social distancing, is that social distancing won't just bring down the curve, which is the rate of incidence of the virus. It'll literally have a chance to alter the virulence of the virus. And this is not getting out to people. This is huge. Right. Right. It, I mean, that's a hope. It's not proven, but it has been seen with other viruses. And um, I think it explains the HIV epidemic. Um, and um, I am, yes, I would say that the hope, aside from finding treatments, is that social distancing will allow less virulent strains of this virus to predominate. Uh, it's a possibility, and it's something we really need to think about. So getting back to furin. So a lot of the interest at the moment is in finding furin antagonists substances that prevent furin from working. And the thing about furin is unlike ACE2, furin is not something that is critically important for our cells. I mean, furin is part of a class of enzymes called pro-protein convertases that are targeted by a lot of anti-cancer drugs, for example. You can immobilize those. I mean, if you immobilize ACE2, you kill people. You immobilize the um, drugs like uh, enzymes like furin, he may have some side effects. There are very Im variable amounts of toxicity, but you really impact on viral spread, on cancer spread that way. Um, so there's, there's a lot of excitement going on there. And speaking about peptides, there, I came across a research paper yesterday, maybe the day before. There is a peptide that inactivates furin. So Which one is we'll that? Oh, it's a new peptide. It's some um, 27 amino acid peptide. This would have to be given by injection, probably intravenously. But at the time of infection, it may make a difference. And maybe they'll find simpler ones. They were working on, well, if it took, if it's 27 peptides that are, then, um, maybe 10 peptides will do it. Because you see, furin itself needs to be activated by a couple of enzymes <laughs> that are called, you know, it, I mean, it's a, it's a whole domino effect. So you right. look for where, where in this chain can you find the weak link that you can break that will, that will stop the cascade of effects. Do you think that nutrients like flavonoids and colorful pigments like anthocyanins? Are those like 3CL protease inhibitors? And can you talk about that? Sure. Possibly okay. playing a role? And where, where and when would we take these? <laughs> right, well, okay, so 3CL protease, is an, that's a somewhat downstream. First, you have um, the furin, um, the, the connection between furin and COVID and the virus, then the virus binding to ACE2, entering the cells, beginning to multiply, and then taking over the machinery of the cell to produce its own damaging proteases, of which the one that is characteristic for coronaviruses is called 3CL protease. Um, and it basically is like a digestive enzyme. CL stands for chymotrypsin-like. So it's as if you've got pancreatic enzymes in your cell, digesting the cell and breaking it up. And um, flavonoids inhibit a lot of enzymes. The question is, if you're taking flavonoids orally, do they get into the cell enough to produce adequate enzyme inhibition? And we don't know that. The flavonoids in uh, laboratory studies that have the best effect is 3CL inhibitors are those that are found in elderberry. And um, they're called anthocyanins. Um, I have had a long interest in elderberry just in terms of treating the flu because they're actual clinical studies showing that it works for preventing colds and treating flus. Um, these colds are due to a different uh, strain of coronaviruses, uh, different strains that are much milder than this. Um, but uh, there is a possibility that if you take enough and if you get, you have to get out ahead of the virus. I don't think it's a good idea to take it when you're sick because it's too immune stimulating. There's a possibility that, um, that having that as part of your diet 
in advance will allow you to accumulate enough of those anthocyanins in your cells that the virus will have a harder time getting 3CL protease to be active in damaged cells. So it's something that you do preventatively. Yeah, that seems to be what what the what the laboratory science indicates. Works so can you give prevention. us an idea of what you would suggest from your own opinion and diving deeply as you have into the science, what people can take uh, before they get sick and that what people might take the first phase and what people might take the second phase? Okay. Well, yeah, these are, of course, there's no clinical proof for these. This is all based on laboratory science. Although, but some of these things have a long history of human use. Um, in you know in different cultures and different forms um, preventively um, elderberry I think makes a lot of sense now all elderberry isn't the same and with the outbreak of this epidemic it may not even be possible to find elderberry on the shelves anymore um, you want an elderberry extract that has the highest concentration that at least states the amount of flavonoids that are in it it states the concentration of flavonoids or anthocyanins. You probably need 300 to 500 milligrams of those flavonoids a day to have any kind of uh, preventive benefit. Um, and if you can find that, it's worth doing. And what you're doing is building up your stores so if and when you do get COVID-19 coming into your body, you're blocking the enzyme that allows it to travel all throughout the body. Um, yeah, that, that's the idea. Flavonoids build up slowly in cells. Um, uh, so, so that's one component. However, elderberry has polysaccharides in it, the starch or the complex sugar component that is immune stimulating. And that may be okay before you get sick. Once you get sick, the immune system kind of flips around and maybe you don't want immune stimulation. So I don't view any of these things as a treatment. These are all dietary factors that may help to prepare you before you get sick. Um, the other, there are a number of food components that have been shown to be beneficial for ACE2 and that support ACE2 activity. I mentioned curcumin and turmeric and um, that, that's one. Um, just as important is resveratrol, which, you know, it's been around for a long time and highly touted for a variety of purposes, anti-aging, et cetera. It's found in the seeds of red grapes or the skins, not in the juice. It, some, there's some of it in red wine. It's found in a number of herbs and fruits and vegetables. Um, resveratrol, I think, is, is, has not been had enough attention paid to it uh, as yet in the integrative medicine community in this setting. Um, it has, has a number of papers on it being an antiviral agent. Oh, yeah, yeah, there yeah. are. And it has been, it was actually proposed as a treatment for MERS right. in one paper. It has, aside from its ACE2 protective effects, it has a number of direct antiviral effects. It also is, has anti-inflammatory effects. And what curcumin and resveratrol have in common is when the, cyt the cytokine storm that happens in the advanced stages of this disease involves the activation of something called the NPLR3 inflammasome, um, which is a s complex structure in the cell, um, highly coordinated and um, like a brigade, an attack brigade, and curcumin and resveratrol downregulate the NP, N, N, L, N, L, N, LPR3 inflammasome and control it. So does melatonin. Yeah, so melatonin is, is, yeah. So are these so, things that you would recommend for the second stage? Um, yeah, well, I would rec I recommend those kinds of, those things preventively. Um, there is a paper out that is recommending high doses of melatonin for stage two. But to begin with, for prevention, let's figure out how do you get your melatonin level up to begin with? Well, 
don't stay up watching late night television. Don't use your computer at night. Don't take your <laughs> smartphone to bed with you at night. You know, I mean, melatonin is something we make in the dark. And um, be careful about artificial what if lighting. you keep doing all those things, but you you take melatonin as a yeah, supplement form? Are you overriding your ability to then, you know, defy the nocturnal time? I mean, because yeah, I maybe, do maybe. stay up I, working on my computer, but then I take a lot sure. of time. Then you time take with, some melatonin. Right. Um, yeah. So you can, frankly, taking cherry juice, about 16 ounces a day, is even though that's a very small amount of melatonin in there, has been shown to be enough to elevate the blood melatonin levels of people. So you could start t- drinking cherry juice. You could take low-dose melatonin preventive just to help get to help get your blood levels at a place that you'd like them to be. And low dose, I'm talking about a half milligram a day, maybe one milligram. Um, there are a lot of people, including me, who can't take more than that. What I mean, happens if, I take if you three, take more than that? You get well, groggy I did that in once the morning? Try and groggy is beyond. Uh, it's way beyond groggy. I took three milligrams once to try and prevent jet lag when I was flying to Europe. I mean, I almost missed my plane the next day. Um, finally, at about two in the afternoon, Chris came over to me and said, come on, we have to leave for the airport. She gave me some black coffee, and that was the antidote. But um, You know, I'm the exact opposite. I, I was a scholar um, at Tulane working with uh, an environmental estrogen think tank, and David Blask was an MD, PhD, whose whole career was melatonin. And he was the dude that discovered that melatonin – blocks glucose going into tumor cells. So when I developed breast cancer, I started taking larger doses of melatonin to be oncologically protective. And it turns out that I do very well with larger doses of melatonin. So it's very individual, I think. Right. It is. My cancer patients take 30 milligrams a day and they feel great with it. Um, so we must have a defect in our melatonin production system, but so, well, there's something you need, there's something individual about responses. But I mean, this, this particular paper, which um, I've read, I wasn't involved with in any way, recommended just boosting up your melatonin if you get really sick to as much as 50 milligrams a day spread throughout the day, uh, along with increasing doses of vitamin C. Well, of, um, of COVID, if you get really sick with COVID, this yeah, paper the was idea on was that? Yeah, the idea was that that is a... Um, uh, I think it came out of Italy, which is the place where they right. love melatonin. They love I mean, melatonin all, in Italy. That's melatonin why, but they they don't seem to be using it in their COVID patients there. Hmm. I don't know. I don't. I don't know I, why not. But um, the, just, my heart is broken with all the fatalities yeah, in Italy. Just broken. I know. Yeah, it's been terrible. Um, so it's, so those are things that can be carried over low doses in stage one. May be carried over to stage two. Um, resveratrol, melatonin, uh, quercetin. You know, right now they're doing clinical trials in China with quercetin for COVID-19. Uh, the research uh, started, I believe, at McGill University um, in uh, Montreal. And so they're trying to determine, will it work? What's the best form? The problem with a lot of these things like re- resveratrol and quercetin is they're not very well absorbed. So it's not as if you can just decide, oh, okay, I'm sick. I'm going to start taking this. I mean, with resveratrol, you build up tissue levels over months or years. So you need absorbable forms. You need to establish dietary patterns that are protective in advance if you're going to expect a response. If someone is going to be going out and buying nutraceuticals, what should they look for on the label of those for the more bioavailable forms? Probably liposomal. Okay. In all of those, quercetin and resveratrol? Quercetin, resveratrol. Can you explain liposomal for people that might not yeah, understand a, it? Liposomal is a technology in which um, oils or lecithin, may, maybe soy lecithin or sunflower lecithin, which is an emulsifier, is used to create these nanoparticles of the substance that you want transported in. And um, it bridges the divide between water and oil 
in such a way that the particles are are um, enter through the GI tract better. Um, but again, you know, there's we don't have time for clinical clinical trials. I wish we did. What we need to do is to look at those things that have been show, at those forms of these supplements that have been shown to have positive clinical effects in other contexts and hope that that carries over to COVID-19. What about hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax? Oh, right. Okay. Well, that's, um, that's a big, it's been a very um, controversial issue recently. And um, the background of this is that chloroquine, which is an anti-malarial and has been around for decades. I mean, people were taking it in Vietnam. The troops in Vietnam were taking it to prevent parasitic infections over there. Uh, chloroquine was tested against the SARS virus and was shown, but it wasn't used very regularly, but there seemed to be some effect on SARS. Um, hydroxychloroquine is a derivative of chloroquine that is less toxic, more water-soluble, and has been used as an immune modulator um, by people, uh, for people who have rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and Sjogren's disease and other autoimmune disorders. Um, it also has been used to enhance the effects of antibiotics in uh, people with late-stage Lyme disease. Uh, doxycycline and azithromycin and clarithromycin, they work better in the presence of hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil because the, what the, what these bacteria do is they create, um, a, they hide in cells in acidic vacuoles and the hydroxychloroquine prevents them from doing this. They keep the, it increases the alkalinity in these um, little uh, lysosomal vacu vacuoles in the cell. Um, and so in the course of treating patients with chronic Lyme disease and some other conditions, acute fever, for example, the combination of doxycycline and hydroxychloroquine is standard treatment. You know, it's done for six weeks. That is the treatment. So a research group in China um, looked at the laboratory effect of chloroquine versus hydroxychloroquine on the virus, on the COVID-19 virus. And they found that they both killed it quite well, but hydroxychloroquine was much stronger in killing the virus than chloroquine was. And chloroquine's and got this more toxicity rate. A few acute cases in Nigeria occurred when they just had access to the chloroquine, I think a week or two ago. Yeah, them, it's much yeah. more toxic. Hydroxychloroquine does have toxicity. Um, most of the toxicity is related to overdose, um, although it, including the, the stuff that's gotten a lot of press with cardiac arrhythmias and abnormalities on the electrocardiogram associated with it. It's mostly been due to overdose, overdose cases, um, and there is chronic toxicity in the eyes. So a researcher in France... Right, the Mersai um, study, right? Right. right. Started administering hydroxychloroquine to people who were hospitalized with um, uh, with COVID-19, and also giving some of them azithromycin. Now, this was an uncontrolled study in a sense, but actually the, what they reported each person was his or her own control. So it wasn't exactly uncontrolled. They didn't look at clinical outcomes. They tracked the viral load. The viral load, right. They had 24 right. patients and one-third were treated standard, one-third with just the hydroxychloroquine, and then the other were the combo. Right. Actually, they're up to 90 patients. Oh, they're up to 90 now. I did reports. not know that. Okay. And it's the same response. What they're finding is that people who just get standard care, after six days, and it was only six days, they still have a, not much change in the viral load than when they first entered the hospital. Maybe it's down 10%. That's all. Um, the people that have got, that got the hydroxychloroquine alone, they have about a 60% reduction in viral load. When they added, maybe it's 50%, when they added azithromycin, Zithromax, 
It was 100% at six days. In fact, the curve was so steep with the azithromycin, I would like to see the data with azithromycin alone. Because was azithromycin only working to boost hydroxychloroquine, or was it doing something on its own? There was a doctor that just tweeted yesterday that he had a terrible case, and he took just the z pack and that he was within 24 hours turned around. So I was wondering, but then I also read an ER doc who was talking about what was going on, that he had tried these interventions, and none of them worked on his patients. Right, right. Well, one of the things that seems pretty, there are a couple of things that seem clear. One is you should not probably not be taking hydroxychloroquine preventively. It may be that if you're taking Plaquenil because you have an autoimmune disease, that you are protected. But um, there was a study done with Zika virus, which is a different kind of virus, but which found that people who were preventively taking Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, before they got infected, had a worse outcome. Uh, presumably because it was interfering with the, with the immune system, the interferon response. Question. So, one of the doctors where I work in Naples said there was some kind of research going on where if you took it once every 22 days, it was prophylactically protective. I don't know. He wanted me to ask you that. I, I haven't seen that, but it has okay. a very long half-life in the body. That is, if you've been on it for some period of time, and you stop it, it takes six months to totally clear out of your body. The half-life is 130 hours, however many, that's several days. And that's only to get rid of half of it. Yeah, so it is possible, but I haven't seen that data. And I really doubt that that study has been done. What they are doing now in the U.S. are controlled trials of azithromycin plus hydroxychloroquine for people who are admitted to the hospital. If you were admitted to the hospital right now, God forbid, I want you to be well. You're one of the resources on our planet, and I really care for you deeply. If you were admitted to the hospital with this, would you want to go on it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would definitely want it. Um, Although I have a patient in Paris right now who has COVID-19 pneumonia, and she went to the hospital there. What they said to her was, well, you're not sick enough. Go home and call us if you get worse. And we're not going to give you hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin because we don't believe the guy that did that study. Okay, so I thought that he was hired by the French government to come up with possible cures for well, COVID, and he's a well-respected... I'm, no? I'm not so sure about that just from this story. I'm not sure what his status is. I mean, I told I said, ask for this treatment. Paris, France is where the research is being right, done. Right, right. Um, so... Um, yeah, so I'm not, and it, that was the experience of one person. Um, now, she might actually have had a better chance of getting it if she went to a hospital in the U.S. right now. Because the Trump FDA was talking about it. Here. The FDA just did an emergency well, okay of u- the use of this, yeah, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, it's, he really, he, he went way out ahead of the curve on it, which really stalled things, but fortunately... They're back on track now, Um, and it is being studied, and it is um, it is approved, but only for hospital use at the present time. Now, I heard a story. I don't know that a patient who had been on Plaquenil for ten years for RA rheumatoid arthritis went to get her prescription filled, and she got a note from the pharmacy saying, "Thank you very much for your sacrifice, but we're going to use your medication for COVID patients that are extremely ill." Have you heard of any Um, of this? Situations no, like this what happening? I have heard is that people who are unable to, um, that people with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis may not be able to get the Plaquenil because it's back ordered. Okay. It's like, you know, th- there isn't any. Okay. So we're kind of coming, uh, we could go on yeah. here for hours. You're just such a resource and you're, you explain things so beautifully. Uh, what else do you think you would like to say in the time that we have left that's important to know? Um, well, I would really encourage people to um, think carefully before following advice that they get on the internet. Check my website if you want. I'm 
uh, post. I have a document that's being updated regularly. Can you send I, me that, and I'll put that in the show notes on my website, sure. drlindsayberkson.com. If you go to the podcast section, we will have Dr. Gallen's recommendations in the show notes, and we'll also have links to his books. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, I will. Um, um, you know, and and there's there are recommendations being made out there that I don't think are well founded, so I take those on. Um, and I'm especially was very anxious to take on um, the ACE inhibitor thing, which I think was totally off the tr- off track. So okay, I'm glad well, look, we're on the same track on that. With you. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, very great. nice to see great you. To talk. We'll How's your touch. wife doing? Is she doing Good, well? Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. I wish that she could be here. I could see her, but okay. I think next time I'm in New York, I want to. G- I'll let, give you a ringy ding, oh, and maybe we can yeah. get together for we could sure. break gluten free bread or something yeah. like that. Right in the brave new world that's going to follow. <laughs> oh boy, let's okay. hope it's soon. So don't right. forget, go to drlindsayberkson.com and look under the podcast section, and we're going to have at Dr. Leo Gallon's website. We're going to have his recommendations, his things that he takes on that he feels like you should not be doing. And we're going to also have links to his books because he is an amazing author that put so much science-based integrative tools in his books. His books are gems and they last forever. And he's one of the real experts on the microbiome and the, the role of your gut in allergies. And he's really someone you should read. So we're going to have his wonderful books in the show notes too. And if you love information like this, don't forget to go to iTunes and leave us a review. And the exact steps on how to leave a review are underneath all the information with Dr. Galland at the bottom so that we can guide you through it. I really want to thank you for taking time. I know you've just been researching, researching, researching. Although you're there in your home, I can see how pretty it is from the back of you. (laughs) Yeah, I'm working remotely and I'm treating patients full-time still. Do you have any COVID patients? Yeah, yeah, I have a a bunch and I'm trying to guide them. Talk about how many do you have? I don't right now, I don't know, eight or nine. I'm trying to guide them through treatment at home. And how are they Um, doing with what you're recommending? Pretty good. The only one that has not really come around as yet is the one in Paris because she wasn't, she had a hard time getting the things that I wanted her to get. Uh, everyone else in the States, they're, they're all, they're all. So could you just list those things a few more for Uh, first at the end of the show? It'll it'll be be at the the end of the show notes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been great seeing you. You don't look like you've changed very much, honestly. (laughs) You look great. Good to talk with you. Okay. Blessings and be well, be well. Bye everybody. (laughs) 